I woke up sweaty and crying, not from the nightmares this time, but from the tear gas that was floating through the open window, a burning reminder that my reality was becoming more serious by the day. I'd been backpacking through Latin America for almost a year. I was young, carefree, and my dreads were looking tight. <laughs> Rastafari. I was about as Rasta as a ham sandwich. <laughs> Just a Jewish kid from upstate New York trying on the third world for size. I worshipped Jack Kerouac and Hunter S. Thompson. I loved their stories, and I wanted my own. I thought I was willing to live them, no matter what the cost was. I landed in Bolivia in the midst of a workers' revolution, which are about as common as mass shootings in America. I didn't pay it much mind. I considered myself street mart smart and figured it would blow over like all the others. Besides, it was good writing material. I could sling off a few freelance articles, get some stories for my book. It'd be fun. The bus ride from the airport was thrilling. La Paz was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Nearly all the women wore indigenous garb, brightly colored long skirts with billowing blouses and bowler hats, infants slung in blankets bouncing on their backs as they carried heavy loads of produce and firewood. Every street was a market, tables full of produce and game, dead goats skinned and hanging, women batting the flies off of them with rolled up newspaper. I saw a march as we neared the city center. Campesinos, the lower classes, farmers, washwomen, miners, and shoeshine boys. It was an election year and they wanted Bolivia's massive natural gas resources to be nationalized, a move that would mean money and jobs, a better life. The desk attendant in my hostel warned me to always keep the windows closed because the police had started using tear gas to disperse the marches. My lack of short-term memory meant that I woke up choking on pepper spray most nights. The next morning, I checked my email for the first time in a week. It was crammed with messages from home. Call now. Where are you? More and more frantic as the days went on. From my mother, my brother, my friends. I found the closest internet cafe and called home with my heart in my throat and my head spinning. My mom burst into tears as soon as she heard my voice. It's Mike. He's dead. He was murdered. I could hear my brother crying, telling her it was okay. I sat in the phone booth, gasping for breath, waiting for an explanation, waiting to be told this wasn't real. Not Mike. Mike with his big, goofy grin. Mike who always came over just before my mom served dinner. Mike from next door. Not Mike. He was like family. He was only 19. My brother finally composed himself enough to speak. It was Eric. Mike got caught at the border with six pounds and a bunch of cash. Eric was afraid he was going to turn state's evidence, so we called him over to the Niagara house to talk and ambushed him with a tire iron, hit him once in the head, and then duct taped him and beat him to death. Then he drove halfway to Fredonia, pulled over on the highway, and threw himself in front of a semi-truck. He's dead, too. The grief made me dry heave and howl. I couldn't breathe, couldn't stop shaking. In the 10 months I'd been gone, the little smuggling ring the guys had set up had gone out of control. Mike had dual citizenship. 
He'd been walking from his mom's house on the American side of Niagara Falls to his dad's on the Canadian side since he was a kid. It was no big deal to sneak a few ounces of weed through. Ounces turned into pounds. Once a week turned into every day. He couldn't move at all, so he got his friend Eric involved to push it through to Buffalo and New York. Hundreds of dollars turned into thousands, turned into tens of thousands turned into a murder-suicide. Every ounce of me wanted to go home and be with my family and friends, grieve with them. My brother told me to think about it. They'd all talked, and my friends thought I should keep going. It's not good here, Eddie. Everyone's a mess. The whole town is torn over it. Mike loved you. He loved that you were out there, man. And he's never going to go anywhere now. I spent the rest of the day walking the streets, chewing coca leaves and drinking myself into oblivion. I bought an eight ball of Bolivian brick cocaine and took bumps off the back of my hand in dark alleys. The campesinos were throwing dynamite. The cops retaliated with tear gas and rubber bullets. I didn't care. Part of me wanted to die out there. That night, the nightmares came. I felt the tire iron hit the back of my head. Screams caught in my throat like a moth in a jar, a muzzle of fear. Duct tape pulled the skin on my cheeks as he wrapped it around my head. I tried to run, flail but I was bound. The tire iron beat a staccato of broken bones, blood in my eyes, in my throat, choking blood, 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 stop! I woke choking on tear gas, stumbled to the window, shut it, and cut out a huge line of coke. Cocaine meant no sleep, no nightmares. Cocaine made it all better. I decided to stay. I met a group of backpackers at the bar, journalists, expat, expats, and drug addicts. They weren't going anywhere, and sobriety was not an option. For three days, I tried to forget. I lived off of booze and cocaine, traded travel stories with them, and worked on an article. By day two, I was starting to vomit bile and blood. By day three, the coup was getting nasty. There was fighting in the streets. The markets had dwindled down to a few meager blocks, and lines for fuel stretched a mile long. The campesinos had choked out the city's supplies with roadblocks that were rumored to go as far as Peru. My new friends started to disappear, slinking away into whatever dark corners they'd come from. The Australian and Israeli embassies sent in helicopters to airlift their citizens out. Flights were impossible to find. I had to leave, and I'd have to do it by land. Every local I talked to had a friend or cousin who knew a secret way out of the city. They swore they could get me to the border for a price. All day, deals fell through. The driver didn't show or the car wouldn't start. I finally found a driver with a reasonable car who would take me to the border for $50 US, a fortune by local standards. But I was not in a position to negotiate. For the first five hours, it seemed like he really did know a secret way out. I sat in the back, drinking Singani, the local fire water, and taking bumps of coke. I could see tire fires in the distance, roadblocks. I thought about the campesino suffering, the violence. I thought about Mike and my mom and my brother. 
I had to make it to Peru. I had to get the fuck out of there. Around midnight, the accelerator cable snapped and we helplessly rolled into a massive roadblock. Tires piled eight feet high and 20 feet wide, guarded by men in ski masks with guns. The driver told me to hide my face. If they found out I was white, there'd be trouble. I pulled my hat low, slung a scarf around my face, and passed the bottle to the driver. It was going to be a long night. Sleep never came. My nose wouldn't stop bleeding, and I kept vomiting bile into a plastic bag because I was scared to open the window. Around four in the morning, I heard a knock on the window. It was one of the younger guards, no more than 13. He looked tired, weary, older than his age. I rolled down the window. Ir, están dormidos. He gestured to the guards, all asleep, drunk on Singani. I gave him a 100 bolivianos and woke the driver up. He knew I had to go, but couldn't hold back tears for himself. He left his wife and infant son back in La Paz with very little money. I gave him all the food I could spare and a hundred dollars US, easily a month's salary. I snuck past the sleeping guards and broke into a run as soon as I was out of earshot. The sun was rising, so I knew which way east was. I didn't have much food, but I had water and direction. The border couldn't be more than 50 kilometers away. Again, I got lucky. I'd only walked about 10 kilometers when I saw two cars, brothers bound for the border with a bunch of Peruvian passengers. They only wanted 25 bucks, which was good because I was running low on cash. We were closer to the border than I thought, only 30 kilometers. I'd make it. Even if I had to walk, I'd make it. These guys were in a good mood. They'd been ferrying people from random roadblocks to the border for three days and were making a killing. They had rice beans, and beer to share. I was able to keep down food for the first time in two days. We were almost there when we hit a roadblock. It was just a line of rocks with two very old men on either side. I could literally see the border. We could have blown right past, but for whatever reason, our driver stopped. His brother in the other car yelled at him to go through but he stepped out to negotiate. While he spoke with our elderly captors, I noticed the oldest of the bunch, El Viejo, sneaking around the back of the car. I crouched and followed him, watching as he pulled out a blade that was nearly as old as he was and hopelessly tried to slash one of our tires. I lost it. I hadn't come this far to be stopped by an aging revolutionary and his rusty blade. Alto, I screamed. Alto, ching it to madre. He stood up, blade in hand, and pulled a move I'm sure he'd seen in one of the thousand bootleg Steven Seagal movies that Bolivianos love. As if to say... Bring it on, motherfucker. <laughs> oh, fuck you, man! I ran towards him, ready to swing. When Mike's face popped into my head. My friends from college were getting married, going to grad school and starting careers. I was in the middle of the Atacama Desert about to punch an old man in the face. Mike would have laughed his ass off if he could have seen me. So that's exactly what I did. I laughed. I laughed so hard, it hunched me over. Everything was sad and absurd, and I couldn't change it. So I laughed with all I had left. 
El Viejo looked at me like I was nuts and backed away. The brothers stared in confusion as I shouldered my pack. I wiped tears of laughter from my cheeks and walked towards the border. I thought of home. I thought of Mike and my brother's words echoed in my mind. Mike loved you. He loved that you were out there.